I'll just talk to you. Um, I'm good at this. Uh, the next group, actually there's three sessions in here. I, w I was wrong. There are three sessions, one from 1.30 to 2.10 and the other from 2.20 to 2.50. And um, the f first one is what's happening in the National Internet K2 Initiative. And we have three speakers on that, and I figure you each have 13 minutes. So if you want to stop after about 10 um, and, and answer questions, I think that would be a good model. Um, the first speaker is uh, James Worley, who serves as the director of Internet 2 K20 Initiative, which brings together Internet 2 member institutions and innovators from primary and secondary schools, colleges, universities, libraries, and museums to extend the benefits of advanced network-enabled technologies and applications to all educational sectors. Um, it's all yours. All right, thank you. Uh, I, am I am gonna sit in front of you. Oh, you're gonna, are you going up there? Yeah, I have, I have some slides okay. that I just if I need to load up. Oh, do you want me, okay. On a, are we using, is that the presentation machine there? Is that, it is. That's, um, that's your present. That's your. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I can. I can just plug this guy in, probably. Give me just a second. Five minutes for um, discussion for technology loading. Yeah, I just want these guys plugged in. Are you two talking together, Luis? Are you speaking with him? Yeah, we're we're all, we're actually going to just do a big panel, so uh, uh, everyone's welcome to oh, come on. Oh, good luck. Then you have to stand just like we did around the. I didn't realize this was going to be a panel. Okay, well, guys. It's a, a quasi-panel. It, it looks like a panel. So All right. Let me finish introducing people while they're doing whatever they're doing. Um, Don Means is the co-founder and principal of Digital Village Associates, a consulting enterprise founded in 1994 that focuses on information, communications, technology as transformational tools and subject for local communities. That's Don. Luis Wong, and actually I saw you at CTUC yeah. when you did your presentation, is the Chief Technology Officer at the Imperial Office of Education. In this role, he oversees the technology operations for the Imperial County Office of Education to include technical support, data center and enterprise systems, local and wide area network education, technology, and application development. He has over 15 years of work experience in the technology field. So, all three of them are going to be together. You get the whole. Mm -hmm. All right. Left. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for having us, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm being asked to move into the into the view. So, so it looks like we're being uh, webcast on this one as well. Um, I wanted to just start with uh, kind of setting the stage. What we're trying to do here today is maybe broaden the conversation to uh, illustrate. Uh, some of the opportunities that are available to community anchor institutions uh, when they're connected to uh, these really high performance, advanced research and education networks, uh, such as Scenic in California, or uh, nationally we have Internet2, which is our, it's our national research and education network. Uh, so that, that's sort of the purpose of the, the K20 initiative. Is to really, it's, it's a really, kind of a practical uh, response to a, a very, uh, very good question, which is once you have this kind of connectivity, wh what do you do with it? You know, what, what can we actually accomplish for, toward our missions when we are moving in toward a world where we're less constrained by bandwidth? So as that would sort of imply, oftentimes what we see are mm, somewhat uh, experimental applications of, of technology to meet particular ends, uh, we're, what we get involved in are not necessarily production-ready um, uh, applications. In some cases, they are, and I, I'm actually going to focus on on one that is production-ready. But but oftentimes, I think our role is more of uh, imagining what a future might look like when you are unconstrained by bandwidth, uh, and and helping to toward the the end of driving demand for for that bandwidth. Uh, so. The community, the Internet 2 K20 community consists of, as I said, K-12 schools, but also community colleges and public libraries, 
uh, there are museums, and a whole raft of other uh, cultural, historic, and scientific organizations uh, that are participating. And uh, we're, we're all part of this, this continuum of education continuum, both from formal to, to informal, at the K through, through 20 uh, levels. And just to give you a sense for the numbers of organizations that are connected nationally to these research and education networks, uh, roughly uh, 84,000 or so uh, K-12 schools are connected. Uh, that, that represents approximately, it depends on how you define a school, right, uh, a K-12 school, but ap approximately six, that represents about 60% of the total number of schools um, uh, nationwide. Uh, then there are about 4,200 public libraries connected, as well as uh, about 1,400, 1,500 colleges and universities and uh, a number of community colleges, about 50% of the, the publicly funded community colleges are connected. And then the, the rest of these numbers, the healthcare organizations are just an approximation. We don't have as good as a good of a uh, handle on how many uh, uh, you know, community health centers uh, and, and hospitals are connected. Uh, but we're this is so this is this is a this is a, a I think a fairly accurate guess, but I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't say that it's it's perfectly uh, accurate. Then there are also a number of of uh, museum a growing number of museums and, and science centers, zoos, and aquarium connected as as uh, I think we're experiencing the same sort of thing nationally as something Lewis mentioned this, this morning that there are an increasing number of, of these cultural and, and scientific organizations, informal education organizations, like the Exploratorium in San Francisco, for example, connecting both in California but also nationally. We're seeing that as a trend. Uh, and we'll, t we'll get back to that theme in just a minute. Okay, so I threw up this map, which shows you, it's kind of hard to see in the, uh, on the screen, but the darker brown uh, represents the states that have research and education networks that are connected to Internet, too. So these are the states that are connecting their, their K-12 schools, their libraries, uh, their museums and science centers to, to the, the, the national fabric of research and education networks. Several other states are uh, are very close to to uh, to joining this community as well. So with the goal being, uh, let's get all 50 states involved. Let's get them all connected. Okay, so you know this this is a is a national infrastructure, but it it, it also extends internationally. We re really are talking about a, a global fabric of research and education networks, that due to ver various peering relationships and memorandum of understandings uh, between various national research and education networks like Internet2 here in the United States, uh, the, uh, globally these networks are, are interconnected. So we really can scope the opportunity here as, as, a, as an opportunity for K-12 schools, not just in this country but around the, the world, to collaborate together. Uh, public libraries to, to collaborate together globally over this, this infrastructure. So that it gets gets us back to that question: Well, to what end? And I think this this resonates with 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 everybody here in the room. That once you have this capacity, once both from the the technical capacity to bring people together, uh, we want to explore you know what that enables. And there, uh, the it's 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 a. Uh, there are some pretty profound, obviously, some pretty profound opportunities. And I wanted to just kind of focus this a little bit on one particular uh, community-driven effort that's underway right now that, that everybody in the room could, could begin participating in and benefiting from, um, and that is uh, the collaboration that we're currently building with uh, some of our national treasures. So um, we have connected now to, uh, to Internet2 to, uh, and, and also then to Scenic as well and the other state and regional education networks, a growing number of, of uh, national park sites, uh, as well as presidential libraries that are, that are administered by the National Archives. We also have now, as of late December or mid-December of last year, uh, all of the, the Smithsonian institutions on the mall are now connected as well. 
So, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty exciting time right now. So we're really trying to, at the national level, the, the community that I work with are, are trying to show what's possible by uh, doing, doing a pilot project uh, 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 of, of one, one kind of iteration of what, uh, what a partnership might look like between uh, the National Park Service uh, when, you, when you, you leverage the network to bring together the National Park Service and presidential libraries toward a common goal of uh, you know sharing the the uh, you know the expertise the the presidential the various presidential historians bring uh, to the table as well as the the park rangers that have uh, you know vast expertise in in, uh, in any given uh, presidential administration or the life and times of a given president's uh, you know contributions to the country. Uh, we're trying to bring them together and and package that expertise in such a way that it meets you know some some curricular goals of K twelve schools, but not just K twelve schools. We, th that's one that's one uh, one uh, particular community that that we're 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 trying to involve, but also public libraries. Uh, we're finding as we extend the, the this uh, this project out to to public libraries, uh, we're we're finding that they. Uh, they're, they're a place that homeschool students oftentimes will come, and that's kind of their their, their classroom, uh, where they'll they'll come there at eight eight thirty nine in the morning, and they'll stay till two or three uh, in the afternoon or later, and uh, they collaborate together, and so it makes the library a really kind of compelling place to to do these kinds of uh, interactive video conferencing programs that like we're talking about here. Um, so in this particular project, we're, we're calling it the, the Presidential Primary Source Project. And uh, we're focusing thematically on uh, w w how each particular president uh, that's represented in the, in the, the project, and I'll, I'll show you uh, who we're involving, which different sites in, in, in just a moment, but how they responded, uh, both them personally, uh, but also their administration and the nation, to a t particular time of crisis in our country's history. Uh, and uh, um, the, as I said, the, the the programs are geared toward six through twelve, uh, grades six through twelve, but they're not exclusively. Um, so the, the uh, these are these are roughly we've designed the programs to be roughly about fifty minutes long, and uh, they're very interactive. So they obviously we're utilizing this you know, two way synchronous. Uh, communication over interactive video conferencing to be able to allow the the presidential historians of these rangers uh, to to uh, open freely discuss with with kids and um, uh, the, the, some of the conversations that we're finding you know kind of coming out of out of the uh, uh, these sessions uh, it's pretty profound and the, the the feedback we've gotten so far from from uh, the, both the teachers and and uh, the students has been really encouraging so uh, I wanted to just uh, talk about, in, in just a brief mode, I'll introduce Louis Wong, who will share uh, his experience uh, in uh, being on the receiving end of one of these programs at uh, a school in the Imperial uh, Valley. Uh, but I'll just set, set it up by describing one particular, uh, this particular event that happened late last year uh, at the, uh, the Jimmy Carter National Historic Site in, in Plains, Georgia. Um, the it, I, 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 w I actually had the opportunity to, to go down to Plains and be present for this this particular event. So I I, uh, I walked around Plains for a, a, you know an hour or so and snapped a few photos. That one in the upper left is of uh, his campaign headquarters. <laughs> you all remember that 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 campaign was run out of uh, the uh, uh, railroad depot right there in Plains. Plains is a, 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 a you know, one one stoplight town, or maybe one stop side town, and that was they chose. Apparently, they chose the the, the depot as the campaign headquarters uh, because it had a public. It was the only place in town that had a had a public bathroom. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but but uh, that the, the lower picture you see, Jimmy Carter sitting alongside a couple of uh, National Park Service folks, uh, is he's sitting up on the stage of of uh, the old uh, school he went to. So it's now become the National Historic Site. Uh, so it's a, it's a really kind of a cool full circle experience for him to come back to that, that site and see it's 
how it's being curated. There's a little museum there, and you know, it's just uh, uh, must be pretty, pretty uh, a really wonderful experience for him every time he's able to go back. Uh, but he he was able to join us for a, a good hour discussion with with kids all over the country, uh, and what what they talked about was. Uh, Kind of his, it was really, essentially it was a celebration of his uh, legacy, at, a really uh, maybe not as well understood legacy of environmental conservation, but later in his, his administration, literally uh, at the 11th hour, uh, he, was, he was able to uh, pass through Congress the uh, Alaska National uh, Interest Lands Conservation Act in November, which uh, preserved... It, it essentially, let's say I have the statistics here, protected 100 million acres of, of federal lands, mainly in Alaska, and that essentially doubled the size of the National Park Service. Uh, so the, it, was a, it was really a conversation about his, um, his role in that, in getting that act passed, and I, I have to share one thing. You know, he's, he's, in, he's, I believe, in his late 70s, early 80s at this point, and he is still sharp as a whip. He was dredging up facts and figures um, and that were just coming off the tip of his fingers from something that happened in you know, late late 1980. It was just it was incredibly uh, uh, impressive feat, uh, and he was very gracious with his time, spending a good long time with with kids. Uh, I wanted to just show before I have uh, Lewis uh, come up and, and talk a little bit about the, his school's uh, participation. I'm going to try to show a, a quick video clip. Of, of an actual question that was asked by uh, uh, one of the students at Southwest High School. So I'm, we'll see how it goes here. I don't. It just gives you a little flavor for the, the discussion that uh, and the opportunity those students had as part of this this project. So ne what I'd like to do now is just turn it up to, to Lisa, and he, he'll just give a little bit more localized perspective on uh, what it was like on the other end to have a to help both set up the, the program, but also uh, maybe from the from the teacher's perspective, what Absolutely. it meant for the students. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and James, thank you for inviting me. And I actually want to thank James for always thinking about Imperial County when it comes to these opportunities. We, we serve a lot of very disenfranchised students in, in Imperial County, and, and I can tell you, I was, I was in that room when this happened. You can see me there in the, in the, in the behind the scenes. 
But but this was such enjoyable enjoyable experience for our eleventh graders, and our, they they will never forget this experience. And and the teacher was really grateful that they had this this opportunity to talk to to President Carter. Um, and, and, and you know James James is always looking at Imperial County to to have these types of opportunities. We really had a short, very short period to set this up, and um, that was some of the challenges that we experienced. And obviously, the classrooms of today are not really set up to have this a lot of this technology in place. So a lot of it had to do with setting the right environment, setting up the the proper equipment. Um, the schools, while in Imperial County, they they truly enjoy great connectivity. We do have a, a robust fiber optic infrastructure in Imperial County that we've built over the last few years. I can tell you that the, the network is truly the, the equalizer and, and bringing this, these types of rich opportunities to our students that they wouldn't have if we didn't have the network. So our, 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 our local fiber optic network connects to, to CalREN and allows and subsequently to enter into in this, this fabric um, that allows us to interconnect to these other, other uh, resources as well. So. Uh, kind of from the technical perspective, we had one classroom with approximately 35 students, very highly engaged. Uh, I didn't really see a student that was falling asleep or anything. They were really engaged on the on the process. It was kind of difficult to pick up a good place where we could put put the camera, but we chose a corner where we could where we could point the camera and try to get as many students as we could. Um, we had to locate the microphone in front of the camera. We actually had two students that were chosen to to um, to make the questions directly to President Carter, while all the students actually worked on the questions prior to a few, uh, probably what, a week a week in advance. They 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 all had a dialogue, and it was part of the classroom activities of really formulating these these questions, thoughtful questions that they would uh, do during the session. Um, our office provided support. Uh, through the whole process of setting up through the event, the dialing, the testing. So we had, had somebody there working with the mics, muting them when it was appropriate so that we, didn't, we wouldn't get a lot of that background noise that um, typically comes in from when you don't mute the mic. So we've done video conferencing for a long time. Um, unfortunately, still in K-12 classrooms, it's not to a point where this works automatically. It still takes a lot of... Um, uh, care and feed, and somebody really understanding what this, what what needs to, uh, how everything really works together. Go to the next slide. Um, so in Southwest High School, they do have um, again, they do enjoy great connectivity out. They they have a gigabit connection to our county fiber network. Um, they didn't have a good working video conferencing unit, so we had to provide one and and and, and loan them one for this for this exercise. Um, we had a VSX 6000 unit. It, it was standard definition, and that was basically primarily driven by, by the folks that set up the, the system. We used a uh, conference bridge by the Texas um, Education to, uh, Telecommunications Network. So all this was going out through our local network, through California, through the national fabric into Texas. Um, and I could say the quality was, was was great. The audio was came in. There was really no jitter going on, and it was it was it was really fantastic. Um, let's go to the next slide. Now, talk about the key challenges. I, I think that obviously these things take a lot of planning. We did have a very compressed timeline to to put this together. So so that was really about scrambling you know, to get some of these things going uh, in a week's advance. A lot of people to talk to, the you know security, the technical folks trying to get all that, that piece. Technical expertise at the, high, uh, the high school campus was a bit limited. So when it came down to you know, really understanding how you know, the firewalls work and how do they support H H323, or the network address translations, so there's a lot of little things hitting there. Uh, when it comes to security and video conferencing. So, so we really had to deal with a lot of those things. After a lot of testing through that, we basically decided, you know, this is not going to work through the regular firewall system. They had a really outdated firewall. And even though it has gig interfaces for the firewall, they're really not running, you know, at a gig throughput. So, so we had to take a different approach. So at the end of the day, we, we scrambled. Fortunately, the, 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 the school had a way to uh, have a direct access to the switch that was outside the school. So we ran new connections and new fiber connections with switches, and then we connected the, the unit by passing the firewall, and that seemed to really clear a lot of the problems. So, 
So, and, and you know, we, we ran into just very trivial things like the speed adjustments on the ports. You know, you have to force those kinds of things. Uh, today, equipment still doesn't interoperate that well, so it's not just about plugging the cable. Uh, it's really about telling the equipment you have to run at this speed and at this duplex setting. If not, those, those things are not going to run. But overall, I think the, you know, the technical challenges were, were um, pale in comparison to really the, the, the value that the, the students brought from this, this, this great experience. So um, the other things that were not so technical, but again, you know, the, these, the, the, the settings uh, in K-12 are, are not ideal yet for a lot of the technology that's, that we're looking into putting in, in our classroom. So the classroom conditions were a bit challenging. We had to figure out the video display, so fortunately they did have a good projector where we could use. Lighting conditions were, were, were a bit complex, um, so we really had to open up all the windows and allow as much natural light that we could to try to really get that good quality video. And the audio distribution was a bit limited, and so we had to really amplify the, 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 the sound in a way that it wouldn't provide any feedback back into the microphone. So, so we really played, we spent a lot of time really playing with the, where the equipment would be set up so it would be ideal. And again, just securing equipment, the adequate equipment in such a, sh a short timeline was really kind of uh, tough. But, um, but other than that, I, I think that uh, we look forward to future opportunities and we, we hope that other K-12 students really have this op these kinds of opportunities and uh, we're really excited to hear that there's more coming down the pipe. Um, James also, just a, a quick little note, James also had us uh, participate uh, not too long ago uh, with the National Poet Laureate of, mm -hmm. what is it, 2011? Yeah. yeah, I think it was in 2011, right? 2011, so you know, our students had the opportunity to firsthand uh, ask questions to, to, the, to the National <laughs> Poet Laureate. And, um, and then not too long ago, also some students in, in Imperial Valley had the opportunity to talk to back then Governor uh, Schwarzenegger in his office directly through, through video conferencing and through some of these efforts. So, so again, lev really levels the playing field for some of our students um, in California. They will never forget these experiences. Thank you, James. All right, thanks, Lewis. Um, yeah, so again, I, the goal here is to, is to leverage these networks and put them to work. Uh, to to bring opportunities and and uh, uh, experiences to to schools all, and libraries all over the country, and that's what these networks are built to do. We're tr and at the K twenty initiative, the national level, we're trying to grab the best of the best nationally. And it, this is the big challenge, right? Is how do you coordinate the national park service to the point where this is consumable on a routine basis? All the things that they have going on on it, every day, there's something that every school would probably want to take advantage of. But how do you get that uh, structured in such a way that we, we heard from Lewis the complexities of the technical are still there with that video conferencing uh, equipment and also configuring the network. Uh, how do we work through those, streamline those processes for K-12 schools and libraries? And then secondly, just the, the programming and the testing, making that easy so that these can be utilized more, more uh, readily and efficiently, and we can get the most out of these networks that we're building. I think those are some of the big challenges. I, I don't have all the answers, but we're certainly, we're tr by, by doing this stuff, we're, we're trying to solve them. So uh, I, I just, real quickly before we shift gears further uh, to a totally different subject for the balance of our time together, I wanted to just, uh, extend an invitation to everybody uh, in the room representing either your library or your school, your community college, uh, your, your, uh, or your, your four-year university to, uh, we have programs coming up and they're available. All you have to do is, is sign up. Uh, this one you can see it just happened recently. Uh, we, we're going to produce like a, a best of reel showing uh, the, the, the rangers at the Andrew Johnson National Historic Site in, in doing their presentation. So you can kind of get a better flavor for what these, these sessions are all about. That happened last week. We have one coming up on uh, the Truman Doctrine uh, being presented by the Harry S. Truman Library on the 25th of, of March. Uh, two times. It's, it'll be repeated. Uh, and then we have another session on uh, April 8th. Uh, again, two, two sessions. Each of these programs are repeated. Uh, and the, it's on uh, Theodore Roosevelt making peace in war, the work he did in brokering a peace between Japan and, and Russia. And then 
One, a really, this will prove, I think, to be a really interesting session on Herbert Hoover, Master of Emergencies. Uh, it's a joint program, which again, I think shows the value of, of the network and bringing together organizations to offer programs that they wouldn't necessarily be able to do jointly before uh, they had access to these networks. Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and then the Herbert, Herbert, Herbert Hoover National Historic Site. So National Archives and National Park Service working together to provide a pretty cool learning opportunity. And then I think lastly, at the end of April, we have another one on Eisenhower and Khrushchev at Getty, uh, Gettysburg, where this was this was a really kind of new to me. I had to kind of research this a little bit, but apparently when talks weren't going well between Eisenhower and Khrushchev on a missile reduction or some kind of Cold War issue, um, Eisenhower said, "Look, we need to we need to have some face time together and just be two guys." So uh, he took him to. Uh, Eisenhower invited Khrushchev to attend, uh, you know, just a day, just an informal day together at a farm that his family had, uh, right near, literally right next door to, to Gettysburg uh, National Battlefield, uh, and and this is this this program will be about a story about that that particular event, and uh, so you are all welcome to uh, to to share this with teachers in your your district. To, with uh, uh, you share it with the librarians in each of your branch libraries, uh, and he, he, the, up there you see the program registration link. It's kind of hard to read, so um, Linda, can I provide these slides and can we post them online? So, sure. and, and, okay. um, Cassandra will post it on the site, right? Is that right? Sir? Yes, that's yes. right. Okay, very good. Just email them to Cassandra; they'll be posted on the city website. Very good. That is efficiency. So I'll, I'll do so as soon as we're done here. So you'll have, you don't have to scramble to, to write this down. You'll have a link to it. And then you'll have a link to the program flyer and everything else, so all the other details. So w I don't want to steal time away from Don Means, who, so what I would like to do now is just sort of do a radical 90, 180 degree shift here topically. Do you want to, um, you actually have time, so he's gone. Do you want to take some time for questions on this part and then have Don talk and proceed? Is, if, if it's okay, Don, I, I just want to make sure yeah, Don we'll gets his due. No, 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 because actually, he's, I didn't realize there's a, a gap time, so oh, I'm okay, well, to you guys. <laughs> we'll we'll gladly accept that as long as the audience is interested in hearing what we have to say, we'll gladly accept that. So, all right, well, let's yeah, let's go ahead and take questions on this before we move on. Yes, Chris. I just <laughs> and he's extremely interested in collaborating with California librarians, and you couldn't work with a better person. Ah, shucks. <laughs> Actually, I can say these programs would be great for libraries, for after school programming or. It seems like, yeah. Yeah, it seems like. They, it would draw people in, I think, even their parents would come and, and adults. Yeah, yeah. We, we actually had a, our first taker on that, that first session. Uh, on Andrew Jack uh, Johnson, uh, we had Craig Public Library up in Craig, Alaska. Does anybody know where Craig, Alaska is? No. It is a thousand miles from Juneau. It's a tiny little fishing village, and they, they were piping this in, and they they loved it. It was a great experience for for that library. Um, anyone have a comment or a question? That's great, great ideas, and yeah, it, it, uh, we've tried to set the bar the technical barrier to entry just to get folks in the door as low as possible, right? I mean, we so we're we're working with a a, um, a net plus, not to use a lot of jargon here, but the uh, an Internet two program which is offering uh, you know above the network sort of services uh, to, to Internet two members. There's a particular vendor as part of that program called Blue Jeans. And they make video conferencing really easy. So you can literally connect a desktop computer with a webcam and that sort of thing to Blue Jeans, and it's, it bridges all sorts of different video conferencing protocols. So if you did have libraries, even if they just had webcam, 
right, and a computer, and the kids or the, the patrons could sit around behind the computer, they, we could make it work for these programs if they wanted to just you know, get their feet wet and start, start doing something now. You don't have to have a, a polycom or a, some sort of like big impressive uh, telepresence uh, investment in your library to, to get started. You can get started right now with most of the devices you all have right that you're working with on, your, on, your, uh, on the tabletops here. Any other questions before I pass it over to John? Okay. Pardon? Oh, right. Yeah, that, thank you. That's a, a piece I totally glossed over. I forgot to mention. The, 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 the sessions are both being live web streamed through another research and education networking partner in Pennsylvania. So it's a great thing about this community. Everybody's in it for the same reason. They want to help each other. Uh, and, and so Magpie in, in Pennsylvania stepped up and said, hey, we'll, we'll stream these live for you guys and we'll, we'll archive them. No problem. Done. So they are, they are available archived uh, on demand once they're, once they're over and uh, we have a page and stuff built so you can easily access those. And we even, we even geek out from a, a librarian standpoint and try to index down, not down to the second, but right, I mean, down topically so that you, you don't just have to wade through as a teacher or whatever, wade through an hour of program to find that one bit of curricular gold that you want to, you know, tune into. Okay. So also, we'll, we'll have to stop there. Uh, and with that, I have another nugget of gold I'd like to share in the form of Don Means uh, joining us from the Gigabit Libraries Network. Don has uh, graciously driven up uh, a couple hours north to join us today. He's going to talk about, I think we're still in the same ballpark um, topically. Um, that he's going to talk for, for the remainder of the time about a pilot project that he's really responsible for uh, making happen uh, on utilizing uh, TV white space, unlicensed spectrum, to deliver broadband to, to, to uh, public library, mainly to public libraries, not exclusively, as Don will, will explain. But let me turn it over to Don, and uh, he'll take it from there. Thank you, James. Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to be here. Actually, it was only 40 minutes from, from Sausalito up here, so it's great to be so close for a conference for once. Um, uh, as James said, this is a, this is a project, uh, but to do a tie-in, I think I've got a segue here. Uh, the Gigabit Libraries Network is uh, uh, an international consortium of uh, libraries, public libraries, uh, looking to share strategies and experience on various uh, uh, technology deployments and, and projects. And that uh, started uh, uh, out of the Fiber to the Library campaign that we initiated with uh, Linda co-sponsoring with ALA and the State Librarian's Office uh, at that time to uh, test this idea of uh, uh, delivering next generation broadband uh, into every community 
through the public library as a natural hub in every community and that that would be the most economical, the most uh, expedient, and the most equitable way to deliver that capability accessibly everywhere. And uh, so that uh, more as a uh, meme than a specific deployment program, which I'm so happy is, uh, uh, looks like it's really happening in California. Uh, the, the Gigabit Libraries Network is pretty much built on the same idea. The library is this natural technology hub in a community. Uh, but uh, beyond the U.S., and that really started in Kansas City, where we were work working with the uh, public libraries there on uh, uh, on uh, utilization strategies related to the to the uh, gig fiber from Google. You know, what do you do with this stuff and so forth? And uh, so one of the things we did, not unlike what uh, was just demonstrated, was set up a uh, a video conference with the public library in Shanghai. And this was a cultural exchange. You know, it was not a, not a big deal. It, it, it was a sister library agreement, and this was the kickoff, and there was a group of people in, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the Kansas library, a group of people in the, in the Shanghai library, and the you know, usual kind of dignitaries. And, and uh, so uh, uh, the, the sister agreement was done kind of virtually by... Uh, you know, a signing ceremony, and then there were the gift exchange. And so here's the, the Kansas library holding up the little stuffed buffalo that they're going to send off to China. The Chinese holding up a teapot they're going to send off to Kansas City and that kind of thing. You know, it's real kind of fun and easy. And then uh, the, the kind of the cultural exchange was uh, two performances. So Kansas City is proud of their, uh, their, their history in jazz, and so they had the high school jazz band come and play. And... <laughs> And then the, the, the Chinese library had the, uh, these dancing drummer girls in, in full regalia, <laughs> these drums on, on wheels, and they come out spinning and drumming. and it, was, it just brought the house down. It wasn't so much that it was you know, high-quality production. It was the fact that there were, this was just for you, in, you know, from halfway around the world, you in this room, and they're performing for you, and the same thing going the other way. And so that really kind of kicked off the idea of, of internationalizing the, the work that we had done around uh, library broadband policy to leading to the Gigabit Libraries Network. And so uh, the first project of this group just began last year, and that, as James said, relates to the availability of TV white space, um, uh, which, uh, go ahead, which, uh, it, who, who's familiar with white space, TV white space, okay. Uh, all right, so this is spectrum that's become available from the digital TV conversion, right? So uh, this is very valuable stuff uh, that's worth billions of dollars at auction, and it's also, of course, very, very much uh, desired by the, uh, by the commercial interests. But the FCC decided that some of this spectrum would be allocated to unlicensed use. Wi-Fi is unlicensed spectrum. There are some others, but... That's the, that's the predicate, I think, for this, is, is uh, Wi-Fi. So uh, uh, what's different about this particular spectrum is that it has uh, propagation characteristics that can go a long way, and it also has penetrability. It's a lower frequency, and that's what gives it the range and, and the ability to go through trees and buildings and even over hills to a degree. And so uh, that's special because all the other wireless technologies pretty much need line of sight. And the fact that this is unlicensed means there's no fees related to it. You know, it's like you don't pay anybody a fee to use Wi-Fi. You just get your radios, and they talk Wi-Fi. So this is the same principle. Um, these are sort of the general parameters of, of white space. Is, uh, uh, it depends, of course, on the power, and then there's, there's a lot of regulatory issues. But just roughly speaking, you know, 5, 10 miles and, and uh, 10 maybe as much as 16 megabits. And so people say, oh, well, we're talking about gigabits here. Well, uh, of course, and, and we're fiber first. We've been championing fiber to library, you know, since, uh, since like I said, since 07. But in doing this project, what I've come to re realize is that the value of the first megabit is greater than the value of the next 999. Mm -hmm. If you're not connected, I mean, let's say, if you are connected, even at a minimal level, you uh, are, it's just so completely different than just having, you know, faster connections. So 
in the, sort of the hierarchy of apps, the, the most valuable ones, I think generally speaking, are the ones that require fewer bits, you know, email and text and then basic web pages. And then you go down to the heavier, you know, uncompressed video conferencing kind of thing that, that uh, James is building the capability to do. That's all fine. Uh, so this is in part uh, uh, an answer to the question of what do you do with a gigabit? Because it's not a simple question. Okay, we can all say future proof, and we can, you know, we can come up with some applications that that really can take advantage of it. The main one is have you know 100 people using it at the same time. That's the, that's the best answer. But then it'll come. And one of the things I think we've learned about tech, uh, telecom is that it's uh, it's supply side economics uh, invariably works. That uh, the more you have the more it pulls people in to use it. Recall first generation, uh, I mean, not first generation, but dial-up. We had dial-up as our main connection uh, capability, but we connected locally through a local phone call that had no toll on it, you know, as long as you wanted to stay on the line. It didn't cost anything. That pulled so many more people into using it than would have otherwise. The rest of the world, you know, charge you per minute, and they go, I can't stay on long. And so that allowed us to innovate, but that's generally true of broadband as well. So, um, so this project then uh, again started in Kansas City, where uh, one of the libraries, one of the five branches, is outside the Google Fiber footprint, and they weren't going to run a, a gig fiber to it. So, uh, you know, I've learned a lot about librarians in this. I'm not a librarian, but I admire librarians tremendously. And one of the things I've learned about librarians is they, they have a lot in common with Marines. They refuse to leave anybody behind. <laughs> So uh, that, that was the issue. What are we going to do about this library with a T1? I mean, T1 is a dirty word, I think. But uh, you know, here we've got gig connectivity to all these other or will. And this one T1, it's actually a learning library out by a, a lake, a beautiful place for virtual visits. So wireless became sort of the, you know, the, the conversation just as white space was kind of coming onto the scene. So that led to the basic idea of you know, doing this. And then that we announced that in May of last year. Others came up and said, well, can we do that? So we talked to the manufacturers and, and launched the project uh, uh, last year. Um, so uh, this is uh, the public libraries deploying TV white space radios to expand access to an essential universal public service, basic no-fee Wi-Fi internet access. Uh, it really should say, uh, access to library services, one of which is the internet. This is, I think, this is the correct way of talking about it. So the uh, uh, the, the the project is looking to uh, prove how uh, you can use this white space to feed remote, what we're calling satellite library satellite hotspots. So this is not Muni Wi-Fi but this is a way for the library to reach outside of the walls, extend access to library services in the community. So hotspots are fed using the white space radio into a traditional Wi-Fi access point of a, you know, 100 uh, feet, but that can be miles away. And so um, there are, uh, uh, it's also, so it's also demonstrating how combining this new unlicensed spectrum with traditional unlicensed Wi-Fi to deliver broadband at multi-megabit speeds, at least better than T1. But the point is, you don't have to pay anybody to do this. You just buy the units, you plug them. It's plug-and-play infrastructure. I mean, this has never happened before. And, and the ability to, to deploy a regional area network, which is technically what this is, as an in-house network, not needing really anybody's permission other than where you're gonna attach the radios in a, hopefully a publicly accessible place, is, uh, is the way this network uh, gets deployed. And so combining these two, and then the other point is uh, the idea that these nodes can also serve, like libraries themselves, as uh, disaster communications points. This stuff is not mobile technology right now. It's not for like a mobile phone, but it's movable fixed. You can move these around and set them up and you have a hotspot somewhere. And you can just imagine how valuable that would be, you know, uh, two minutes after the, after the next earthquake. Um, so these are the uh, participants uh, in, in, as of now, um, six states, 
uh, and now three other countries besides the U.S. are running these uh, in different stages of deployment. And so some are, are, have just gone right through. Others have hit uh, barriers of backhaul. You need about 10 megabits to feed one of these channels that could support you know, a handful of remotes at the same time. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, so we're moving from there to basically uh, the, the last one, what we're calling an open proposal uh, for California. And if the presuming this, the, the legislation is signed, uh, then there will be a lot of very fast endpoints. A lot of nodes that have been running T1 lines now have, you know, a, a thousand times or 800 times faster connections. So they're going to have more than they know what to do with on the, on the first day or so. We're suggesting that one thing, a very good thing to do with gig connectivity, is to share it, is to spread it, and using this wireless technology to peel off, uh, let's see, uh, 1%, I think, would support a channel. That's 10 megabits to support a, uh, a network. And I think all these gigs can afford that. You can get more channels by getting more radios. This is early production uh, technology. Uh, the two main makers are, are California companies. Um, so uh, by, by employing this stuff, uh, which right now the, the, the hot spot, the endpoint radio is $1,000. The hub is, is like 2500 So right now 1000 should be going down half or a third of that in a year. So that's, that, that would include, of course, the, the little access point. This is early stage technology, uh, but it is proven technology. It's being deployed around the world and, uh, uh, and offers the opportunity to leverage gigabit connectivity quickly and inexpensively to make access to digital library services more convenient to the patrons. I mean, the number in, in the nation is uh, where I came up with this 10 million number. The number of people that access the Internet at a library is a quarter of the entire population. That's roughly 80 million people access the Internet at a library. Only 20 million, only 20 million have no other source of, uh, of Internet access. Well, that's a huge number. Those are, those are people 14 and older. So, uh, so I just took, you know, the, 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 that same number in California would translate into about 10 million and why I asked the question earlier about how many are accessing wirelessly or workstations. Uh, anecdotally, it seems like half. It's probably growing. These devices are getting cheap. More people are coming in with, uh, with their own devices. So uh, it's, it's a huge number. And if even half the libraries, which I presume are rural, if that's according stays with the national uh, uh, average, then 500 or so libraries could create, you know, two, 3,000 new public, publicly available access points. And uh, we're also encouraging all the participating libraries to create a splash page so that people know what it is that they're accessing. It's a way for the library to kind of brand themselves, extend their services out in the community. Uh, the one that got running first was in, in Colorado. I'll stop uh, with that. Uh, uh, Western Slope, southwest Colorado. And they, they jumped in the, in the pilot. We did a, an open call to participate. had like 60 applicants and chose six. Uh, two of them are state uh, consortium. Uh, but uh, right in the middle of the, of the trial, this four-month trial, uh, they had their budget cut. You know, not, a, not a totally unusual story. But that left them stuck. The cost of the network for them was like $6,000. So uh, they said, well, we're, we're going to have to send the equipment back, it looks like, unless we can raise the money somehow. And so they decided to uh, launch a Kickstarter program, and they raised the money on, with Kickstarter. I mean, not only was it actual money, but it also was a great marketing campaign to let the whole community know, you know that they were, they were doing something for the community. They raised the money, raised the profile, and now it's running successfully. And they're uh, looking, this was a county library, looking to do uh, deployments in the other parts of the, of the uh, county. And so it's a lot of fun. And the main thing about it is that uh, you don't need anybody's permission and you don't have to pay any fees. You just buy some devices and you stick them up, you tune them like you would uh, uh, the old TV antenna on the house, you know, back in the day. And, you know, and you've got, you've got multi-megabit connectivity. It's yours. So, so I yeah. know that we have a couple questions, too, okay, if there are. If there are, you know, sure. Because I would. Sure. Hi.
Yeah. Well, most. Right. Most of this uh, uh, battling took place uh, five years ago over whether or not to allocate some of this new spectrum for unlicensed use, which wasn't a universal uh, opinion. But uh, the battle was fought. Uh, the FCC universally voted to allocate some for unlicensed use. Really on the same idea that, that uh, Wi-Fi was you know, junk spectrum, nobody, it was just messy, nobody wanted it. I mean, people want this, but the fact that, that it was available and there was so much experimentation took place and, and now you know, there are five billion Wi-Fi devices on the planet. So if this is like a tenth of that, it'd be a very big deal. Uh, the too good to be true part, I think, would relate to uh, that it, currently it's not available in the densest cities where they have most broadcast channels occupied by TV broadcasters. So the Bay Area and LA and New York and Miami, but most everywhere else there's some channels available. And on the resource page at uh, Gig Libraries, yeah, I've got a link. Yeah, the giglibraries.net, there's a, there are databases that these radios check to see what's available where they are. And they also, you can see how many channels are available in that, in that area. And for once, you know, the rurals are getting the break because they've got a, a huge amount of this stuff to take advantage of. Uh, but uh, it's still being kind of fought in, in Washington at the FCC to keep as much as possible, and even to open some in every market. And I would say that the libraries are the ideal uh, caretakers of this resource. I mean, it'll be open, anybody can use it, but we're saying that it's, that it's a perfect place for the libraries to step forward and, and utilize a public resource, a public airwaves to deliver a basic access uh, service and you know, do it, use it or lose it is the kind of a thing that, that goes with this. Yo. Forgive me if you've already said this, and my eyes are so bad I can't read that screen. <laughs> but, uh, I'll use a bigger font next time. It was just, you know, you hit the thing, you really get a good, right? Uh, the price points on the radios. Yeah. About where was that? Uh, the remotes now are about $1,000. It's a little bit of variance from the, from the manufacturers, and the base station is like $2,500. And that's today, and they're building these more or less by hand until, I mean, they haven't been able to sell them without FCC certification, which has been kind of drawn out. Now they're starting to be certified and commercially available. We put them out on a trial basis where they didn't have to pay until the end. And so uh, uh, the, the expectation is when they ramp up that, this, that these remote radios would be half or a third of what they are today, $300, seems to be the price point that the wireless ISPs in the rural areas think that they could then sell or, or finance in home use. But this is another case of, of the libraries pioneering a technology like they did first generation broadband when a lot of people had their first experience of streaming media at the library. And they go, ah, oh. you know, you talk to me about bit rate, show me fire hose and straw drawings, you know. Give me an experience that I, that I can relate to. And, and so library as early adopter is, is being replayed again here, I think. Okay. Okay, time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you uh, to Don and Lewis for, for joining us on the panel today. And thanks for your thank you.